Hey, what's up guys? It's Davro Gaming here, aka Worm Rider on Steam, and I've got a new tutorial for you guys. This is going to be my open world RPG tutorial. And uh, in this video, this is just going to be the introduction. We're going to be talking a little bit about setup, what you can expect to learn in this tutorial, um, how you can use your own sprites if you don't want to use uh, the exact things I'm using. So, for example, if you want to make your own game, I think this would be a perfect tutor tutorial to follow along to. Um, and yeah let's just get right into it so this is what the game looks like right now it is an open world 2d rpg type game you can see we kind of have some clipping here on shrubs right now i just have random spawn locations for the trees and bushes and then we have this grass background and then uh over here we have a building we can go up to the building press e to enter it now we're inside the building we can walk around could put assets inside the building as well and then uh, as you can see we can't go past the walls of the building these aren't isometric textures meaning we're not viewing them from a certain angle they're just kind of flat 2d textures so to give it the appearance of being inside I only have the back walls set up and then we can exit the building and we're right back out here we also have attack animations although there's currently no enemies and that's about it. I think this really gives you the basic building blocks to build an open world RPG type game. Um, so far, this is all I have created. If you want to see how far this project is when you're viewing this video, for example, if you view this a year later, um, I might have added quite a bit of uh, content due to, you know, essentially how well the community reacts to this. If people want me to keep going with it, I'll keep expanding the project. Um, so check the description. You'll find this on the Steam Workshop. I'll have a link to it down below, as well as the assets if you'd like to use those assets. Um, and uh, you can just take a peek and see if it is any further, or you can just check my YouTube channel. I will be producing um, videos as uh, I update this. So um, yeah, I think with that being said, we can pretty much get started. and. Uh, I'm going to show you guys essentially how you should uh, prepare your sprites to use them if you're following along for your own game. And then um, also I'll be going over the code structure in this because we're going to be taking a more object-oriented approach to coding in Lua, which uh, many of you might not be familiar with um, unless you have experience in something like Java or uh, JavaScript. So, so starting off with assets, um, basically I just looked up 2D sprite sheets and uh, I, I've just picked one off the internet. The specific sprite sheet that I'm using is created from an RPG Maker game. Um, they're really basic. They don't really have a lot of weapons, but you can find them out there. So I know it's not copyright. The one that I'm using is not copyright. It is uh, fair use because it was created by a generator used for um, these types of games. Um, I might link that down below, but to be honest, it's not very useful. Um, and essentially, I, I just went through, searched, found some assets I thought would work well that don't have watermarks, and I just decided to use those. You know, nothing on the Steam Workshop is really out there for commercial use, so not a big deal, depending on where you get the assets from, um, because, yeah, you're not going to be making any money off of it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this Zelda one could work pretty well. Once I had the assets downloaded, um, and to be honest, the main assets we're looking for are character assets, some tree assets, and then um, you know some wall textures, a floor texture. Uh, if you saw on Retro Gadgets, I had a door texture, and um, what else? The building, the outside of the building texture as well. So. Now I use GIMP for all of my texture editing. And essentially what I do is I create a new project that is uh, 64 by 256. That's 64 height, 256 length, because that is the max maximum texture size that Retro Gadgets allows you to use. And then I usually like to pick, a pick the texture size beforehand um, and draw the textures natively. So uh, I prefer to just use the draw texture function inside Retro Gadget and to do my texture sizing beforehand. That being said, you could use the function raster sprites, which allows you to resize a texture of any size or a sprite. Um, and I should mention sprite and texture, I'm using pretty interchangeably here. Um, 
Raster Sprite allows you to resize a sprite or texture of any size um, to another size on the screen. So that could also be really useful if the texture you want is quite a bit bigger and you want to raster it down to a smaller size without losing as much detail. Um, when I scaled these down, uh, there was detail certainly lost in a few areas. And then for the main player, I'm doing 32 by 32 here for the texture size. And in GIMP, the easiest way to do this is to just go ahead and set up a grid. Um, you go configure grid, 32 by 32, horizontal and vertical, OK. And then you'll have to go view, show grid. And that will display these grid lines that you see here, which are really useful. Um, and then basically, I cut out each texture individually, one by one. If you want to take a look at the attack textures right here, or attack sprites, right? I basically just removed the background with the eraser or with the uh, the wand select here, the free select. Um, I think they also have kind of like a magic wand in Photoshop. Um, so you can select everything of a certain color to get rid of the background. And uh, that's, that's the uh, resize sprite sheet down there. Anyways, here's the attacking textures. I did do this as a separate sheet. And uh, one thing I want to note, if you are going to be making your own, is that note the position here. So for walk left, we have three different frames for walk left, and that's in the first three positions. Walk right is also three frames, and then it's right below it. So we're essentially just changing the Y position on the textures. Um, and this will help us for our animation system when we're cycling through the animations. So walk left, we could say, uh, you know, play frames, 0, 1, and 2 on when y equals 0, which would be this first row. And then for walk right, we could play zero, frames uh, 0, 1, and 2 for y equals 1 for the bottom row. And I, I basically just duplicated the left textures for the right down below. And uh, this is our idle texture, our standing texture. Um, I can't quite remember if I use this in the walk animation, but it might be used there. Um, and then we just have an idle slash standing left, idle right. Now we have an idle facing forward, idle backwards, and then our walking textures for forwards and backwards as well. Okay, now I'm just going to show you guys what the shrubs look like real quick. So here we have the trees. I resized these, um, and these I did 64 by 64. I wanted the trees to be larger than the player and the bushes, you know, shorter than the player. But um, also I, I wanted to add some flowers in there. I mean, you can get as creative as you want. I used a, uh, a tree sprite sheet that I found online for this one. Um, and, and you'll notice I wasn't too concerned about the bottom on these because these are going to be spawned randomly in the background. Um, random generation can be nice uh, for, you know, a quick and easy, like, background look but if you look at games like pokemon they purposefully place every sprite in the background because you know random generation you could potentially have clipping between two sprites in their locations um or uh you could run into other issues where like all of a sudden they come across a patch that's like all of one sprite and then a large empty area where there's nothing of the other so I use random uh, placement in Retro Gadgets, as you can see, for the background. These are kind of randomly placed here. It's randomly seeded, in a sense. So every time we replay the game, um, you know, the background will always be the same because the random number is seeded uh, based on uh, the same initial value. So it'll always be the same. It's just the placement is random. I didn't choose the placement for any of these. Um, I did, however, choose the placement for the building. And uh, one thing we don't have quite yet is collision on the buildings, but I did choose the placement for the building. And then I also manually chose the placement for setting up the inside of the buildings. So you could also spawn other buildings. You know, you can essentially duplicate the building spawning, create a new object and set it somewhere else based on its position. So now that we have that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about how this code is going to look like in retro gadgets. So here we have the basic class diagram of our project. Um, I just whipped this up. It's not super accurate. It's not, um, you know, 
down to the every last detail, but it essentially gives you a good idea of how this is going to work. Essentially, our game controller is going to be our main script running on the CPU. It's going to have the update function, and we're only going to use that one update function. Um, and if you guys have never seen one of these class diagrams before, essentially the values in the top are going to be considered our uh, attributes, things like uh, variables for that script. And then in the bottom, these are going to be our methods or our functions. So it's going to have um, various holders for the trees, the buildings, the background, the current building, our player object, um, and then a clipping distance for at which distance should we uh, let the player be in front in the foreground or in the background behind an object. And then, whoops, we're also going to have um, the setup functions. Uh, I'm, I missed the save function, but that should also be in there. And then draw functions for the background, the foreground, the buildings. Um, it will also handle our this check building boundary. This is what ensures that our player is actually inside uh, the building tiles when they're walking around instead of just uh, wandering outside of those because uh, the inside of the building is not infinite and we don't want them just walking off into the void. And then, of course, the update function. Um, our player controller mainly handles the player position, um, whether or not the player is interacting with an object, and then its functions are more based around updating its position and animation. So we'll have some walk animations, um, our walk functions as well uh, for the different walk animations. And um, if you set up the sprite sheet like I did, you can actually use one function and then uh, it, you can use a, a neat trick I'll end up showing you guys. So one function can deal with walk left, right, up, or down, just depending on a uh, direction parameter. Then um, for the scene, our scene is basically just the textures, which is our background, the lo location of each texture, and then um, we will update the location of that object depending on where our player is. <clears throat> and then buildings, uh, they're pretty similar to the scene. The scene also covers um, the shrubs, I believe. Uh, the shrubs are a scene object and then buildings are separate. Um, but also textures, location, and then we'll also have an update, not just exterior, but also interior, and then we'll check if the inside door is usable. Um, now, in object-oriented programming, one thing that we like to do is, you know, create an object. So you can think of all of these uh, three externals as objects. This is like a player object. We could have multiple players, although that would be kind of uh, weird since we only have one set of controls. We'll have many scene objects um, because each one of those is essentially like a, the scene texture as well as like the shrub texture. And then we'll have multiple building objects. Each building object will represent one building and um, it will have its own parameters for the location and uh, where the doors are, which sprites we're going to be using. So if you notice, uh, scene and building are actually pretty similar. So it would be kind of nice uh, if we could extend, you know, scene, um, extend building as being part of scene, considering, uh, you know, some of their, a lot of their attributes are going to be the same as well as the functions. Um, I haven't really gotten um, inheritance to work in Lua. I've read the docs on it. Um, you know, Lua is not really meant to be an object-oriented language. So when we think about like classes and inheritance in Java, um, it does translate to Lua, although it's not really meant to be uh, a language where you have, you know, dozens and dozens of classes uh, and, you know, different types of inheritance and extension. So, you know, optionally, if you have the knowledge of how to do class inheritance, and Lua, you know, you could say building inherits from scene and then you could extend scene and uh, create some new functions on building. Um, so that way it's just a little bit different. Um, if you don't know what any of that means, don't worry. Uh, we're just going to be going with these as separate classes. I think it'll be easier to learn that way, um, especially since the syntax alone for just doing the class setup in Lua is a little bit strange and you may not have seen it before. So, um, with that being said, all right, with that being said, that is basically the end of this introduction video. Um, if you want to get your sprites set up, go for it. Otherwise, I'll have 
the sprite download in the description. Um, I got some comments on the last video that Mediafire isn't very user friendly if you don't have Adblock, so I might be using Dropbox instead. Um, and then go ahead and check out the workshop link to this and see how far we are. Um, I plan on making these videos a little bit shorter. I would like to keep them less than an hour in length for each um, section. So we'll see how well we do with that. You know, maybe 30 to 45 minutes. I think that's a pretty good time um, for people following along. And then, yeah, we'll be doing all the coding step by step together. So thank you and have a good one.